As I said in my introductory remarks, this panel uh, came about as a result of um, 50th anniversary recognition. I think I said celebration. And the celebration recognition piece, we, we actually went back and forth on how much to talk about it in a celebratory context. Uh, one of the old adages that I'm always mindful of is the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I don't know if necessarily that's a good thing in the context of civil rights, right, and the challenges that we're facing today. But I wanted to ensure that uh, a broader campus constituency could benefit from what I thought was an absolutely amazing and robust conversation about uh, the Civil Rights Act 50 years later, where things were then compared to where things are today, and more importantly, presenting this as an opportunity for us to self-reflect and engage and discover what things we can commit to moving forward on an individual level to try and ensure that the landscape of civil rights is expanded and improved upon. So without further ado, I'll just quickly introduce our moderator, one of our panelists, uh, Professor Will Jones. So Will, take it away. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's, I, I actually I skipped out on this panel last year for a family emergency, and so I got promoted. So I, I, don't, have, I don't have to do the hard work. I get to just ask the questions. Um, so we have a distinguished faculty panel um, to talk about the history, evolution, and current state of civil rights in America. Um, and they've agree agreed to share uh, their ex expertise during this observation of the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, we have uh, Patty Lowe in, in the middle. Uh, Patty is a professor in the Department of Life Science and Communication. Her research interests lie in television documentary production, diversity, and Native American media. She's the author of several books, including Native People of Wisconsin, a social studies text that's used by 15,000 elementary school students. Uh, she's also an enrolled <clears throat> member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. Stephen Kantrowitz, to her left, is a professor of history with a focus on race, politics, and citizenship in, in the 19th century United States. He's the author of two books, Ben Tillman and the Reconstruction of White Supremacy, and more recently, More Than Freedom, Fighting for Black Citizenship in a White Republic, 1829 to 1889. Ben Marquez, who's closest to me, a professor of political science. His teaching and re research interests are in political sociology and American politics. He has published extensively on Latinos and American politics. He's currently the director of the Chicano Latino Studies Program, and his latest book is called Democratizing Texas Politics, Race, Identity, and, Me and Mexican-American Empowerment, 1945 to, 19, uh, to 2002. Carrie Sperling, on the far end, uh, is a clinical associate professor of law and interim director of the Frank J. Remington Center. Her legal practice focuses on civil rights and post-conviction litigation, and her writing and research applies to the latest social science to legal persuasion and legal pedagogy and address the dangers of unreliable forensic science in criminal trials. And some of her cases have been treated and have been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Slate, and other publications. Um, and last but not least, we have Karma Chavez, an associate professor in de the Department of Communication Arts. Research on her research is on uh, focuses on race. Sorry, on the relationships among race, class, gender, sexuality, nation, and immigration, utilizing queer of color theory, women of color feminism, and rhetorical criticism. She's also interested in social movement building, activist rhetoric, and coalitional politics, and the rhetorical practices and discursive constitutions of marginalized groups. She's the author of Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric, and Coalitional Pol Pol Possibilities. So we have a, a great panel. <laughs> And they've been asked to address a number of specific questions, uh, and then we'll have time if any of you want to ask questions uh, from the floor. We have two microphones, uh, and after about a half an hour of discussion, we'll have time for you to come up and uh, ask your own questions. Um, so I thought I would just start by posing uh, the, the question, 
an opening question of what are the new civil rights challenges facing us today? Or are they the same core challenges in different guises? Ben, do you wanna, do you wanna begin? Oh, sure, I'll go first. Um, actually, I, uh, I, I think a lot of the, um, the issues the new civil rights issues are, are just the, the old civil rights issues, uh, sometimes in a different guise. Um, uh, Long-standing grievances, and not just among people of color, uh, which is something I think we should discuss, uh, but, uh, but issues of unemployment, education, housing, health care, poverty, police brutality, uh, political representation, voting rights, uh, and voting rights especially these days, one of the major victories of the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s, uh, are all problems that are, that are still with us uh, uh, today. Uh, there are some issues that I think are also long-standing but are getting uh, more, uh, more play, uh, and that is the politics of immigration, uh, marriage equality, the outsourcing of jobs, uh, rising inequality, and, uh, and prison, uh, prison reform. Um, I worry a lot uh, also about the, um, about the rising brand of conservative politics, a, uh, a particularly cruel and, uh, and virulent uh, uh, strain of, uh, of politics that we're seeing uh, in, our, in our society today, uh, one that, um, that I think is, um, uh, is, is seeking to delegitimize government, uh, to de eliminate the social welfare safety net uh, that, uh, that was a, a centerpiece uh, of, the, of the civil rights movement. Of the uh, of the nineteen uh, the nineteen sixties. I don't know how brief you want me to keep it, but do you want us all just to respond to why that first question? Yeah. Why don't we get a few sort of quick answers from down the table? Okay. Um, Carmen, you you sure. I, I can jump in next. Um, I guess I I would start out by saying I think one of the things um, that whenever we're in forums like this, we should do is recognize that we're we're still settlers on stolen land. Um, I think we should always start things like that. So I'd like to take the moment to acknowledge that and um, say that I think that remains one of the key issues that um, needs to be addressed continuing. Um, relatedly, I would say I think different guises is a, maybe a good way to put it. Um, I think we have, for example, um, comfortable middle class ar across communities of color um, and yet uh, economic uh, injustice remains significant, I think. Um, and that, that has a racial component especially, well not especially, it has a racial component, a strong racial component. Um, I think we need to be speaking about things in terms of justice and not equality. Um, I think we need to be thinking about how issues relate to each other. Um, we can't do that. All right, we can't focus on anything without thinking about the relationships. And so um, I think a lot of the issues remain uh, salient but it's time for a more complex um, and intersectional lens to, to address them. So I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Great. I want to thank you, Karma, for pointing out that we're on um, stolen land. And uh, I want to give a shout out to um, the Ho-Chunk people on whose ancestral land um, we gather today. Uh, for Native Americans, um, the civil rights issues remain the same. Um, it's always been a confusion about sovereignty and treaty rights. That makes us a little bit different than other groups of color in the United States. We specifically are mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. We have political and legal rights that other groups of color don't have. Um, for us, the recognition of those rights has always been a challenge. And today, we're facing, you asked about new challenges. Um, they're the same challenges, although they're escalating. Um, we're very concerned about resource extraction on our lands, which not only threaten our natural resources, but also our way of life. And um, I hope to have the opportunity to talk about that a little bit later. So the civil rights challenges at the moment seem both profoundly the same and profoundly new. Um, they're the same in the sense that uh, it remains an uphill fight to create a kind of broadly inclusive citizenship that includes equal dignity uh, and justice for all people. At the same time, civil rights itself is an inadequate framework within which to address that because it's very good at establishing individual prerogative and right and very poor at establishing collective or community justice. The challenges are different, I think, or at least different in kind, if not in, different in scale, if not in kind, in three different ways, and, and just briefly want to mention them. First, 
the escalating privatization of American life, the way that social experiences and relationships are being eroded, this public square is disappearing, money is becoming speech. We're witnessing what Dr. King called the thingification of our society. Second, militarization, uh, the full penetration of both vigilante violence and state violence into our daily lives. From the top, with the militarization of policing, Madison has its own uh, MRAP, armed rescue vehicle, they've rebranded it. Um, and the doctrine of force protection of soldiers and officers has replaced the dignity of individual human life of citizens. And then from the, from the bottom, from the vigilante end, from, with stand your ground laws. Uh, shifting the burden of proof from authorities to individual citizens, giving greater legal standing to those with weapons than those without, and to particular kinds of people with weapons and particular kinds of people without. Um, and finally, uh, along with privatization and militarization, de-democratization, um, disenfranchisement of previously enfranchised voters as both a <clears throat> tactic and as an ideology. That is something with legitimacy. And in here, we're looking much more at something like the late 19th century than we're looking at the civil rights struggles of the 1950s and 60s. I want to follow up on that. Um, you know, I look at civil rights at this point um, from the lens of someone who directs right now nine different clinics at the law school that deal, uh, that service the prisoners of Wisconsin and some beyond. Um, and I just want to throw out a, a fact that um, Next year, when we, when we celebrate the Voting Rights Act, 50th anniversary, 34% of all black men in Alabama will not be able to vote ever again in their lives because they will be disenfranchised because of the systematic imprisonment of a vast number of our population, mostly brown and mostly poor. Um, and that is a trend that I think is really hard to get at because we believe that we've made you know, huge ground by um, ridding our laws of explicit discrimination and uh, legally uh, explicit segregation and discrimination based on race uh, and other um, ways of, that we've discriminated in the past. But now we face um, really very dangerous forms of disenfranchisement, impoverishment of entire communities um, not based on anything uh, that we can grab at in the law that focuses on one particular group of people, but certainly affects one particular group of people much uh, more profoundly than any other. And I think from a perspective of criminal justice, uh, that's something we're gonna have to deal with. Thank you very much. Um, I think you get a sense of how rich this conversation is gonna be. And Several of you mentioned very specific instances of sort of contemporary civil rights struggles, but I wonder if we could hone in on that for a little bit and talk, talk in specific ways about uh, two or three specific battles that you think you see sort of at the forefront of what you might, what we, at the struggle for civil rights today, and talk a little bit in sort of specific ways about how they differ uh, or, or perhaps don't differ from, um, from struggles 50 years ago. Um, Patty, do you want to begin? I was really struck by Rebecca Ryan's comments about climate change, because for Native Americans, we are inextricably tied to our land and much more likely to feel the effect, and we're, we're not uh, a terribly mobile people, so we're, we're unlikely to move away from our reservations for any permanent, uh, in any permanent sense. And so, um, for example, we're, uh, in my own communities, uh, uh, I'm a Bad, Bad River tribal member, and in the ceded territories of our lands in northern Wisconsin, lakes that produced wild rice, 95% of the lake uh, in one particular lake in Burnett County um, was producing wild rice just five years ago. Today, there's no rice in that lake at all. And it's complicated. We just can't say, yes, it's climate change, but um, the water temperatures are definitely rising. Uh, rough fish are, are moving in. They're competing for food with native fish. They're spawning in, um, in the shallows uh, that, and destroying the, the root system of the wild rice. So it's, it's complicated. 
Um, our birch bark is getting thinner and more brittle. Um, so we're seeing these effects in our communities, and that would be bad enough, except we're also feeling under assault from resource extraction in industries that you know, want to put big mines or you know, log vast tracts of forest, and that sort of thing is going to speed up this process that we already are feeling the effects of. So these are the, you know, climate change is definitely, um, you don't think about it in terms of civil rights, but for us it truly is. Steve? So, yeah, uh, in the late 19th century, sorry, <laughs> In the late 19th century, there was a very popular phrase among the people who wanted to limit voting rights, and that was that wealth and intelligence should govern. They were unabashed about this. They truly they believed or acted as though they believed that voting was a privilege that should be, must be, restricted to people who knew how to exercise it responsibly. During the 20th century, that vision of an exclusive, voting as an exclusive privilege was gradually undermined and replaced, largely in the context of the United States competition with the Soviet Union, um, with a vision of, uh, of voting as a fundamental entitlement of citizenship to the extent that people speak about voting rights today as though we have a right to vote. We do not have a right to vote. You do not have a right to vote guaranteed to you by the Constitution. The Constitution, in theory, guarantees that the right to vote cannot be denied you on certain specific grounds. Those grounds do not include, quote, wealth and intelligence. So voting, uh, voting restrictions uh, can be as numerous as the stars in the sky so long as they do not explicitly target the, the very small number of protected categories in American voting rights law. And now we're witnessing a concerted campaign to make voting a privilege. Carrie pointed to the very troubling statistics in Alabama and Florida, but I think we're, we're about to see uh, similar uh, movements elsewhere. The voting, uh, the, the so-called voter protection or voter ID laws of the last five years or so, I think are not the end of the story. Uh, I think their temporary stay in the Supreme Court is very temporary. Uh, I think this is a battle that we're gonna be waging in the next few years. Um, I, I watched some people in the run-up to, to this election speak about you know, not being willing to vote because they were not happy with the choices presented to them. And someone else say very smartly, voting is harm reduction. Voting is what you do to keep them from doing the terrible thing they want to do to you or to your community. And I think uh, the civil rights challenge that's, that's emergent in this moment is the challenge of harm reduction in the sense that we need to maintain the right to vote, or whatever possibility of democracy remains in this country is going to become quite evanescent. Although I, I got to jump in and say um, that I think for a long time, at least you know after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, um, people really thought that they were voting for the right policies. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the ones that were supposed to protect us and get rid of drugs and those sorts of things. Policies, whether intended or not, had huge consequences for our population. Now we have over 2.2 million people in prison. It's unprecedented in our history. It's unprecedented across the world. Um, and again, we're going to feel the effects of this for a long, long time because at the same time that we were putting people in prison, at enormous rates. The prison rate in the last 30 years has increased 500% across this country. And so you talk about the people that are taken from their communities, taken from their families, um, in a war on drugs. And we feel better that we've rid the country of drugs um, because we've, we've massively incarcerated uh, a huge portion of our population. Um, in, in the coming years, one in three black men will have served time in prison at some point in their lives. Um, and so again, these policies fall disproportionately on the poorest and uh, darkest communities in our country. Um, to me, it, lining up with you know, the, the Civil Rights Act, and then from that point forward, starting this movement of mass car incarceration, to me, um, looks like a, a, a you know, fun, a, I mean, just a, an interesting guise 
to get people to buy in to another form of oppression. And, but it takes a long time to wake up to these things. And voting isn't the only answer. Um, and the problem is the courts aren't set up to deal with this kind of sort of subterfuge of discrimination. Um, it's, it's set up to talk about individual rights and uh, explicit discrimination. And so we've got to figure out other ways to fight this kind of subtle and sort of under the surface, beneath the surface, um, segregation and degradation of large parts of our population. Mm -hmm. Carmen, do you want to? Yeah, I'll jump on that point uh, just for a moment because I think, um, I think one of the things that we really need to think about with regard to the question of mass incarceration is how it ties into all of these other issues. So for me, what that means um, is not just dealing with the problem of mass incarceration, but thinking about um, why we turn to incarceration as a solution at all. Um, and that then turns me to a bigger question, which I think is how are we organizing in our communities and with our communities um, to create spaces that are um, livable for people, for all people. And I think it's interesting to have a conversation like this at a university. I suspect most of us in this room are fairly comfortable. Um, and that may not be the case. Um, and it may be that your job sucks or something too and you're forced to be here. Um, but, but the people who, I, I, I imagine many of us in this room are not directly in connection on a daily basis with those who are most impacted um, by things like incarceration. And it's not our communities who are most directly impacted. Um, and so for me, the, the, the issue for now for civil rights is how, how can those of us who have privilege, those of us who have access to institutional power, um, how can we broaden our, our communities of uh, engagement, our communities of influence to understand these issues from the people most impacted um, and start doing the community building that's gonna need to happen because the law is the law, but without communities who are willing to organize to change them, it, it, it's, it's, it's less relevant to me. So, so that's my interest is how are we um, building those kinds of communities to challenge issues like incarceration, to challenge not just militarization of borders, but borders and the question of, of you know, does the U.S. have the right to be a sovereign nation at all? Um, so I think we need to be pushing our imaginations um, in this moment. Thanks. Okay. Ben. Um, I think your question, part of it related to, you know, asked, you know, what is the, large, the biggest civil rights issue uh, of today? And, and to tell you the truth, I, I think that that's a really, really hard question to, to answer. You might want to grill one of your grad students on that one of these days. You know, what, what is the biggest uh, uh, issue and, and why? Uh, well, I, and I'll tell you why, why I think about that, why I look at it that way. Uh, uh, for example, immigration reform uh, is really a very big issue uh, among Latinos. And one of the reasons that they stayed at home largely in this last election was that politicians were shying away from that. Now, it's a very difficult issue to address, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's very important to Latino voters. But consistently, what public opinion polls tell us is that, uh, that there's, there's three issues that outpace immigration reform, uh, and, that's, and that's jobs uh, and jobs uh, and jobs. Uh, so so that, that, always, that always comes out on top. So, uh, uh, so maybe I, I, I guess I would call that the, the top uh, uh, civil rights uh, immigration issue if you if you force me to uh, to choose <laughs> but uh, but you know what what is it that that actual organizers uh, are, are talking about uh, in communities and they're just they're just countless organizations some of which have been with us for decades others which have uh, have begun you know and then f and then subside very quickly uh, and uh, and they're looking at all different kinds of things. Uh, they, they look at jobs, uh, they look at education, they look at their schools, they look at environmental justice, they look at police brutality, uh, uh, they look at uh, uh, marriage equality. So all of these things are issues that organizers have to formulate and, and bring to the decision-making table. And, and I started out by saying that there are a lot of long-standing issues but how do you, uh, how do you, or I should say problems, uh, but how do you turn those problems into issues? And that, that's, that's the skill of the, uh, of the organizer. So they're always there, uh, but, but how, how do you bring them, not to some point of resolution, but how do you address them? How do, how do, you, how do you bring them to a decision-making decision -making form? Uh, so so that's, that's actually a very, uh, a very tough, uh, tough issue. You know, I kind of hate to leave it in an, in an academic way, but I, I think that's the truth. <laughs> well, that's why we had asked, the experts to come and tell us. Um, it actually leads really well into the next discussion. I mean, I think we've sort of put a number of issues 
um, on the table. And one of the issues, I guess, the, the, you know, the, a number of you mentioned voting in the previous election, which you know, I think raises a question of, um, on one hand, the, the, the last week's election, a big issue was, was, was res voter restriction and the access to the right to vote. But an equally important issue was participation by people who had the right to vote, right? Mm -hmm. that, um, and particularly among young people, right? That we saw a remarked uh, drop off in participation by people who had the right to vote, but for a number of reasons didn't see that it was worth their effort. And I wonder, um, I guess sort of to shift a little bit toward from sort of identifying the problem, but toward what are some of the solutions? What are some of the ways in which um, we, uh, as members of a community uh, at the university, as members of a community in Madison, um, can do to actually engage in ways that are meaningful for, for people and make people feel like they actually have a stake uh, in the fight? So. I think one of the things we can do is educate people <clears throat> and promote campaign finance reform. Because um, we had, um, for example, we had a very successful effort in Indian country to get out the vote, but we represent such a small percentage of the population that we can't influence um, many elections by ourselves. But we did manage to uh, promote um, a state senate candidate, the first American Indian, um, to run, and he ran. He was able to raise nine thousand, just under ten thousand dollars for his election race, his opponent raised $490,000. So, you know, there's a bit, I mean, it's a, that's a problem. We, and it influences all issues at all levels. Yeah. And so one of the things, you know, I think we need to do as, not just as people of color or as people who are particularly interested in an oppressed um, group, uh, but as all Americans, we need to take back our electoral process and get big money out of elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Karma, Karma, do you want to? Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, and I also, I'll always turn my attention away from electoral politics um, and towards <laughs> community building, um, not because electoral politics aren't important, but because um, I think it, it, it's, it's important to emphasize, I think for a university audience in particular, one of the things I hear all the time um, when I'm in Madison doing stuff is that most people don't view the university as viewing itself as actually a part of the community. Um, and I think that's something, that's a critique we all need to take very seriously, and it doesn't apply to many of you in this room, um, but it might apply to some of you. Uh, and so if you're wondering if it does, assume that it does. Um, <laughs> but how can we, with all the resources we have here, and I know we're under attack, I mean, just, you know, thinking about Voss's comment about, you know, the kind of research that leads to economic development is the only kind that should be supported at the university. Of course, we're under attack, but we're very, very privileged, and we have a lot of access to kinds of things that people um, outside of the university don't necessarily have access to. So what are the ways we can build meaningful connections as part of this community? Um, and I think especially for, um, for those of us maybe across the board, often universities are sort of transient places um, where professors in particular don't feel like they're actually part of the community because they might be bought up by a better university in a couple of years. Um, but integrating ourselves, getting to know our community and building those connections, helping people um, to educate themselves about why things like campaign finance matter, about what sovereignty rights are, about what mm -hmm. prisons even are and why they matter if, they, if they're communities that don't know. Um, is vital, vital, vital. We have to do that work. Um, and so that, that's, I'm gonna be my sticking point for the day, I think. Ben, do you want to? Uh, um, <clears throat> always with a good question, so. I, I guess I should respond, can I respond by telling a story? Of course. Um, <laughs> when I, uh, early in my career, I was, uh, I, I study social movements, I study political organizers. And, and I was interviewing someone, and, and organizers are amazingly gracious uh, with their time, and, uh, and they're always willing, mostly, uh, to talk to me. But I'll, I recall one interview that I had with a woman uh, who, um, who wanted to ask me a question. And she said, uh, uh, tell me something, Professor. Uh, what good will your research do? Uh, and that question has always haunted me. 
Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we can do uh, uh, at this university is, is uh, for most of us, is to admit that we're educators uh, and that we should do what we do best and we should educate uh, the students of the state of Wisconsin. And that means everyone. Uh, that means we should educate as many students as possible and work to diversify the faculty, the staff, and the student body. And, and I think that's how we can have a greater impact. I, I, I know very few academics who successfully bridged the worlds of academia uh, and, uh, uh, and, and political activism without shortchanging one uh, or the other. Uh, so that, that's a very, very hard thing to do. So I, I would like to see uh, uh, a diversified faculty. I would like to see uh, uh, outreach programs. I'd like to see internships promoted by the university. Uh, uh, I would like to see uh, the Wisconsin idea fulfilled here. Uh, that is that we are here to, uh, to serve the state. Uh, but boy, activism is, is a hard thing to do. It's, it's, really, it's really, really tough. So let's just do our job, uh, do our job well and, and, and try to be connected. But can I jump on you for a second on that? Because I don't <laughs> think I'm advocating necessarily for activism. I'm saying people need to be involved in their communities mm -hmm. in ways that are meaningful, which whether that's your church or whether that's uh, supporting a community organization. And I think a lot of people connected to universities don't do that. That doesn't have to be political activism. That's just called being a community member. Um, so I just want yeah, to clarify no, I was, that. I was thinking of something different. No, I, I think this is a really important, a, yeah. important question that I think yeah. we can involve the audience in too. But Steve, why don't you yeah. follow up and then we'll come back. Just, just very quickly, I, I think yeah. um, academics have a tendency when they move out into communities to still want to be teachers. <laughs> And that can be a good thing, but it can also mean talking down to or just at people. And I think uh, the challenge for, for us, I, and I don't mean to target anybody particularly, uh, but I just mean the challenge for people at the university reaching out from the university is not to be perceived as having all the answers mm -hmm. um, and listening in the way uh, that I think engagement in a community organization that Karma's urging, I think, can do. Mm -hmm. Carrie, do you want to either touch on this or go back to the question of just what, in well, general, people can do? I mean, I guess touching on this, I think, you know, I like this question of, of our roles as professors because, um, you know, it, it seems to me that the fight for civil rights has changed. Uh, I think we all agree on that. And, um, and really, to get to the bottom of it, it takes an, a, a certain amount of expertise to see what's going on. So you need a Rebecca Ryan to throw it up on the screen and tell you that your you know, race-neutral laws are completely failing in housing and education and in the criminal justice system and how it's failing. It's a lot more sophisticated debate now and it can easily be overcome by a lot of campaign spending that just throws up some, you know, what we commonly think of as well, we're fighting, we're tough on crime, so, you know, vote for me, and, and I've, you know, put more criminals behind bars, and I'm making you safe. And it really takes the academics who study this stuff to get in and say, that's really not the policy you want. Mm -hmm. In the end, that's mm -hmm. going to destroy you. So I'm, I'm going to ask the panel to discuss one more question, and then I'm going to ask all of you to come up and uh, take the mic. So think about questions or comments, with either intervening on some of the discussion that we've had or uh, raising issues that we've ignored. Um, so just to, to, to end, I want to point toward the future. And um, some of you have probably heard this quote. Uh, Martin Luther King used it. He was actually paraphrasing a 19th century theologian. Uh, but he said, the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends toward justice. And I guess I'm wondering, is that true? <laughs> <sighs> it's, it's a very long arm. Yeah. I, people can bend it toward justice. Uh -huh. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just thinking about something I experienced this weekend. Um, there was a youth on film festival at the School of Human Ecology, and there were a number of Bad River families that, that um, attended because there were three young filmmakers, and uh, they were lodged at the Fluno Center, uh, where a lot of North Dakota f hockey fans were lodged. And so I dropped my charges off at the hotel and got them um, uh, uh, 
got them um, into their hotel rooms at the front desk. And we were literally surrounded by people in the green and black, you know, uh, fighting suit yeah. mascots and logos and, you know, war paint. And they had, oh um, and I, I was just astonished that this is still an issue. Yeah. And it just doesn't seem to be an issue on anybody's radar. And if it were any other group of color, um, you know, that we wouldn't put up with that kind of thing. So when we talk about, you know, bending justice, um, boy, how far does it have to bend before <laughs> it, it, it breaks and people recognize the kinds of long-standing, you know, I injustice that's, that's out there? I, I, I realize that that didn't really answer your question, but I just had to get that off my yeah. chest. <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> it just really bothered me, and yeah. and this issue just doesn't go away. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, it does answer the question in terms of I mean, <laughs> we can't assume it's bending very quickly. Right? <laughs> Karma, did you? Want to... uh, I would just say no. It does not. <laughs> no, I mean I think we have to bend the. We we justice requires us. There's no um, kind of like I, my my least favorite thing to hear people say is change takes time. Yeah, Change doesn't take time, it takes labor and sweat and people dying and people standing up for what they believe in and people not, um, you know, not, people refusing to, to just sit down and let things pass them by. It's not time, it's us. Yeah. Um, and I just think uh, we have to be very careful to um, let there be an agent other than us um, for justice to happen because it has to be us. It has to be all of us collectively together um, every day in our classrooms, in our communities, in our homes, um, and addressing each other's issues. So, you know, like the, the Indian Mascot Coalition here in town, like, or in, in Wisconsin, I mean, all of us, even if we're not indigenous people, we can support um, those efforts, and we should be supporting those efforts collectively. Um, and I, so I just think I, I respectfully uh, disagree with Dr. King. Um, <laughs> it, it requires all of us. Yeah. Ben, did you want to oh. Yeah, I, I also think the answer is no. Um, I, um, I think there are structures of inequality that are deeply embedded uh, in our society uh, that, that don't change easily, uh, at least as easily as I thought when I was a young man. Uh, and, I, and I think, and I, and I really have learned a lot from the people that I've interviewed uh, uh, who are in the trenches uh, struggling. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, they, that some of them pointed out to me uh, was that, uh, that you really have to distinguish between what's an issue and a problem. Uh, for example, a world, world hunger uh, is a problem. Uh, and you can't solve problems, but you can work on issues. You can work on hunger in Madison. So you can do something about that now. And I think, uh, I think even if you're going to become uh, an activist and dedicate your life to it, there's only so much that you can really achieve even in a lifetime. Uh, so the arc may, be, may actually trend in that direction, but we can't really know. <laughs> so it's just the pessimist in me that says it's, it's not going to come about. But you can make life better for some people in your community, uh, those that, uh, that you know. Uh, so I, I worry a lot about, also, I think that, that that brings up an issue I wanted to raise, and that is looking back at the 60s and sort of fetishizing what, on, what went on at that time, that there was this momentous movement, uh, big change came about, and, and some really important changes did occur in our society, uh, but, uh, but there were a lot of uh, limits as well. I mean, you know, you know, the great icon Martin Luther King had a lot of other things in mind that he wanted to change, and that, that did not occur. And I worry about looking back at the 60s so much, this is the 50 first anniversary of the, uh, of the Civil Rights Act, is that right? Uh, well, we're, you know, um, uh, uh, we're living in a much more diverse society and a complex society, uh, and a society that's no longer defined racially by the black-white binary. So it's really a, a, a very difficult one in which to, uh, uh, in which to imagine and try to, uh, to assemble the type of national coalition that we saw in those times. And, and, and I wonder as well, relating to the issue question, is whether or not we could, we could actually do that on the scale that we witnessed uh, at, that, uh, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to thank the panel just initially for these initial comments. It was really, we've um, raised a lot, we've put a lot on the table. Um, issues of, of privilege, of climate change, of voting restrictions, immigration reform, 
mass incarceration, jobs, jobs, and jobs. <laughs> and I'm wondering what, what, what if we left out or the things that you, that you think that we need to be talking about or questions that you have for the audience. So if you, um, if, if you do have questions or comments, please come to the microphone uh, here and then we'll come back and allow the, um, the, the panelists to wrap things up at the end. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Maldonado. I work with uh, Boys and Girls Club of Dane County. Um, so the theme here um, from a lot of the panelists was uh, kind of engaging in the community. I know you all work on specific issues that have impact. Um, how do you all individually break free from the ivory tower? <laughs> And also, um, to, what, to what extent or what are the university's shortcomings in bridging the community and the university? Thank you. I mean, I'll jump in real quick. I think the primary university model for engaging communities is a service learning model. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of us do that in, in courses. And I think there's a lot of value to that, but I think, um, it, one of the things I do is I help to run a, a books to prisoners project here in town, and um, every every semester, you know, faculty will st send their students who have to do 25 hours, um, and then to you know write a paper about the project. And it's really great, but none of them stick. Like none of them keep on doing. Maybe one or two hmm. um, have stuck on it. So, I think. Um, Rethinking a service learning model to make it more sustainable. It's probably the same at the Boys and Girls Club um, with students coming in. Uh, so, um, but you know, I, I, I um, personally do a variety of things. I do this books to prisoners stuff. I um, work a lot on community radio, um, work with uh, prison abolition activism in town and those kinds of things. Um, and I work with statewide network on immigration reform. Um, and uh, you know, these things are connected to my research in some ways, but uh, also to my political interests and. Um, I try to bring my expertise when relevant and, you know, move tables and chairs when relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I have a class that's set up as a service learning course um, that where undergraduate, uh, the capstone experience is creating public service announcements and media projects for deserving nonprofits, including the Dane County Boys and Girls Club at one time. Um, my outreach is with Native communities teaching Native youth uh, digital skills and helping, that, helping grow the next generation of land stewards and digital storytellers. But one of the problems that we uh, run into is that 80% of Indian country lacks access to broadband. Mm. So it's very di difficult to close the digital divide when there aren't the basic access opportunities that, that other communities have. And ours is complicated by the fact that, um, you know, we don't own our own land. And our land is held in trust for us by the federal government. So as an individual tribal member, if someone wanted to be an entrepreneur and set up some kind of internet-based company, for example, first of all, there's no access to, to broadband. And second, um, if that individual goes to a bank and the bank says, where's your collateral? We have none because we don't own and we can't use our land as collateral. So there are all kinds of opportunities that are, you know, that we just are, that, that stymie, that, that are op opportunities that other people have that um, are challenges for us. As a person who works on the 19th century, it's often hard to translate the things that um, I study and teach into any kind of um, 21st century reality. So my, my own outreach is voter registration and trying to work right now on creating a work, asking the questions that might help create a more healthy and sustainable food culture in the public school system, which sounds like a minor thing until you watch mm -hmm. what they're eating for breakfast. Huge. Wow. Um, uh, but, but I think uh, this coming year, uh, Kathy Kramer and I are going to be involved together in a, in a course on uh, a cluster of courses that ask students to think about citizenship. Um, and I'm very excited about um, learning from that process what, um, what, how to take the big frame, the, what Carrie, I think, correctly referred to, the kind of the expertise that we do have and, and the, the big picture that we can often bring to bear based on, you know, years or decades of, uh, of study. Um, to bring it together with people who are interested in um, uh, in, in a more daily and, and community uh, reality. 
So I have the privilege of, of being the interim director of the Frank J. Remington Center at the law school. And um, Frank Remington was an amazing person who um, got involved with the American Bar Association looking at um, policing and, and imprisonment of, of our population uh, early on in the 60s. And out of that grew a project where uh, we began putting law students in the prisons. Um, to s he thought, you know, if this is the medicine to cure the ill of the criminal justice system, lawyers ought to be familiar with it. And uh, out of that grew a partnership where uh, the University of Wisconsin law students were providing legal services for every inmate that entered the prison system in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, got a screening, got legal assistance with maybe family law issues or some sort of contractual issues or maybe sentence issue, you know, sentencing issues. Uh, it ran the gamut of just any, and, and we found that, you know, people when they leave prison do a lot better if they don't have legal issues. Um, those have been settled before they get out. And, and, and of course, you know, as I talk about mass incarceration, that can no longer happen. We don't see but a small portion of the percentage of, of, of the people in prison now in Wisconsin. But, but we have nine different clinics that uh, operate directly with the prisoners in Wisconsin for different um, specialties and, you know, family law and just uh, sentencing innocence projects that I co-direct um, where students really get in and, and that we drive to the prisons and we meet with people and we, we just get entrenched in the system so that um, when these students go out and practice law, no matter what they do, whether they're engaged in the criminal justice system or not, they know uh, a bit more about what happens after those people leave the courtroom uh, and, and then what happens in the communities that they leave behind too. Thank you. Ben, do you... Oh, yeah, I, um, uh, I'm, on the, uh, I'm on the board of the Wisconsin American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, so we work on a lot of different <laughs> issues, uh, you know, voting rights, marriage equality, transportation. Uh, we're deeply involved in a number of issues that affect uh, people of color, uh, both here and, uh, and nationally. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, I think, a good way to, uh, uh, to reach out. Uh, and, uh, and it does take up a lot of time uh, sometimes. Uh, but I think here at the university what we can do is, is again, con not not let up the struggle to diversify uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin. This is a flagship university, and, and we have to work on that. And I think one of the issues that has occupied me over the past year has been our ethnic studies programs. I mean, our ethnic studies programs have been defunded to the point where they're just in tatters. And it's, it's remarkable uh, that, uh, that the University of Wisconsin is, is killing these programs as our society is changing so much around us. I mean, you talk about an ivory tower. Uh, you know, the community itself is increasingly diverse and changing, and, and we're behaving as if, as if that doesn't matter. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a fight that has its, uh, its roots in the history of the institution as well as, you know, fiscal struggles. You know, we're, the university is screaming in pain because of the cutbacks, uh, and the uh, and the weakest uh, uh, the weakest entities get uh, get hit get hit first. And, and I tell you, our, our budget is tiny. If you want, want to discuss it with me, I can tell you uh, we don't have much to take, but they're but they're coming after it anyway. It's always hard to know when if you should clap at something. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or, or comments they want to put on the table? Would you use the microphone, please? Thanks. My name is Sherry Vester, and I'm involved in the UW-Madison community, through the UW Odyssey program, through the UW Family Voices program, through the UW People's program, and I can, uh, through the McBurney Center, through the TRIO um, program, the list goes on and on. I also am involved and have been a part of the South Madison community for many years. Um, I have six children, I have a husband, and I have many children through the Boys and Girls Club. I have many children through the People's Program and other programs here. I started in 1980 in early childhood care development. My question is, the person that was here at the Boys and Girls Club just came to the mic that asked the university those questions. I'm also the parent liaison for Family Voices. And how are you doing? And what is the Boys and Girls Club doing to take care of the South Side families and the children, including my son, who works at the Boys and Girls Club, Christopher Bester, 
Samuel Best, who works within the prison ministry there, and me now in graduate school. What are you doing with, to help my family and other families with the same questions you address at university? What are you doing financially? What are you doing emotionally, mentally? What are you doing with the beautiful articles in the paper and the many uh, paychecks that you're given? What are you doing to take care of your own front and backyard with the very questions you ask the university? I ask you that humbly, and I ask you that in love. Are there, do other people have questions that they want to direct at the panelists or um, issues that, to raise? Um, Uh, my name is Ella Welch. I'm an undergraduate student here um, in political science, and uh, I'm also a member of the Chancellor Scholarship Program, um, which is an excellent program. It's really the way that I was able to come to this university. And my question is, um, I feel like I've had to defend myself a lot for being part of the scholarship program, and also just being um, a student of Native American heritage, um, and I guess I'm wondering, uh, is our affirmative action plans uh, and through admissions, is that working for the university? And is there a better way? And um, at what point can students of color stop defending themselves for being here? Um, I guess that's a question for that. Yeah, thank you. I want to jump in just real quick and I want to re return to the question before that and then I'll return to your question because I think one of the things that we have to do if we're going to do diversity work is we have to deal with hard questions when they're right in front of us um, and we have to be willing, it, it, you know, we have certain ways that we like these forms to go and to feel comfortable and a question might seem to you out of place but it may not be out of place. Um, and so I think it's really important that, um, you know, we understand where people are coming from and, and take those questions seriously and I'm not sure you know, if, if Joe could answer that question on behalf of the Boys and Girls Club, but I think those who have elected themselves as our leaders, whether it's us up here, our community organizations, have to be accountable to our communities. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Does anybody, can anybody speak to the, the question of, of welcoming students onto the university from uh, whether it's crossing class barriers or racial or ethnic? Um, national boundaries. Um. I, I, uh, do you, what I understand about the, uh, the um, McNair Scholars Program, the Chancellor Scholars Programs, and um, uh, programs that are targeted toward underrepresented groups, student groups, or individuals, was broadened out after the Baki decision, and maybe, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I don't play one on television. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but it, you know, that was, a, that was a University of Michigan law student who sued, uh, 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 alleging reverse discrimination, and it really struck at the heart of a lot of affirmative action programs that universities were using. And since then, many universities, including Wisconsin, broadened out the eligible yeah. applicants to include not only students from targeted minorities, but also students um, who were economically challenged and came from um, households where they were uh, the first generation of student. And so um, I don't think it's race specific these days. That's my understanding. It's, it's interesting you talk about, so, so the Baki decision uh, was back in the 80s, it was University of California, but uh, since then we've had a lot more decisions from the Supreme Court and, and they seem to be, again, sort of striking down a lot of affirmative action measures. And one thing that this reminds me of is, is you know, Justice Harlan and Plessy versus Ferguson long ago said that we have a colorblind constitution and again, that was dress, addressing sort of explicit, uh, legally sanctioned uh, uh, discrimination based on race. Um, 
In, in the Bakke decision, Justice Brennan said, uh, this is a really dangerous metaphor, a dangerous concept, a colorblind constitution, because you know society is not colorblind. We are not colorblind. And so I, you know, I think what, what you're feeling is that um, although we, may, we, we make efforts, I think, as institutions who see that we're not doing a good job of, and, and, and for whatever reason, sometimes we can't figure out the reasons why we're doing a bad do job in diversifying. Sometimes they're under the surface, and so we try different measures, um, but, but it really um, strikes, I guess, people in power as somehow violating their sacred yeah. constitutional rights to be on equal footing. Right. Um, and so that's where these issues get really complicated, is that, um, you know, oftentimes the law is not helpful and not our friend in these situations where uh, we're really trying to get under the issue of, of why can't we make change? Um, what is going on? Why is there still uh, a disparity in uh, the number of, of minority students and, and then trying to rectify it at the same time that those in power keep saying, you can't rectify it based on race because you didn't want to discriminate on the basis of race. Uh, so it's, it's complicated and frustrating, uh, but I think that the Supreme Court's moving in probably the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, if I can just say to the, to the young woman who raised that question, let me just say that every, every liberation movement since the emancipation of the slaves in the 1860s has been followed by uh, a, an assertion that now the deck is clear, now we can all be treated as equal individuals, and if you ask for anything else or demand anything else, you're acting against American ideology. And so what I, all I can say is, it, to push it back against that and say, you only mean meritocracy when it serves you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To push back against that places you in a hundred, very noble 150 year tradition and there are lots of historical precedents, lots of historical role models, lots of present day role models to help you gain strength for that fight. So. Yeah, and the reality is that we don't come to the table with the same opportunities and skill set. If you uh, come from an, a poor urban area, your parents probably didn't buy you the $300 CD set um, that helped you prepare for the SATs, didn't purchase the tutorials that, you know, maybe some students in more affluent suburban schools, maybe you had to work after school instead of doing extracurricular activities which made you, you know, look like you were involved in sports and uh, and music and dance and all those things that, that students do to create a richer, fuller resume that looks good to an admission committee. It's different when you're struggling and you don't have those opportunities. So, you know, it, it, um, it, is, it isn't a fair system. And uh, so the universities who attempt to address that through opportunities for students who come from disadvantage, um, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds shouldn't be criticized. Yeah, I, um, I, I was very hard, it was very hard for me to hear uh, that, um, that you felt so bad about, uh, I wanted to respond to the question about being on campus and always having your presence uh, questioned. Uh, I, um, I was, a, I was a student here uh, in the late 70s and uh, in early 80s. I was in graduate school. Uh, and uh, you know, <laughs> you won't believe how integrated this university looks compared to what it was like uh, back then. Uh, just, <laughs> you wanna know how bad it was. Uh, that, that's, my, that's the way that I, that I look at it. And, I, and actually, I, I didn't have a community. I didn't have uh, an ethnic studies program that I could migrate to and feel comfortable in. Uh, I just felt that I guess I have to be miserable until I'm done. Uh, but you don't have to be. Uh, get involved. Uh, uh, don't let this university retrench because it will. Uh, and it's doing that right now. Uh, uh, it will abandon its mission to diversity, uh, uh, not only in the people here, but in the programs that it offers. Uh, and, uh, and what I hear over and over again, and what I feel myself when, I'm, when, I, when I engage in activity, is that I feel better just being involved. 
Uh, and that's not the answer. That won't stop people from questioning your presence here. Uh, but you have a right to be here. Uh, you're part of the state, and this institution should serve you. Uh, so, uh, so fight back. Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't assume that uh, the university will take care of you, uh, because uh, it won't. And to that Native student, don't apologize for being here. Do something wonderful with your life and give back and make a difference when you get out, out of here. So we have time for one more question if somebody wants to raise one, and then I want to give the panelists a chance to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Shanita Lawrence, and I am a staff member here at the university. And my question is, um, I've been here almost eight years, and I've been to the diversity forums. Um, I am participating with the Med Schools Diversity Committee, and there's no diversity. I mean, I look and I don't really see what the university is doing to diversify its staff. We talk about our students, and I believe that our students have to see leadership within themselves that they can look and say, hey, this is someone that's like me. And I know that since I've been here, um, going to different seminars and stuff, I always feel like I'm the outcast or like, you know, I'm sitting over here by myself because there's no diversity. So my question is, what are we doing to bring diversity to the front so that when we look at our students and our staff, we can see each other? Because I don't really see that. Does anybody want to try to address that? Or? You could ask some of the administrators in the audience how they'd like to address that. <laughs> um, I just, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, okay, I've been in the history department for 20 years, and um, I know that it, it, just within that community, which is the community on campus I know the very best, tiny community, a couple hundred graduate students, you know, 50 faculty members, and then untold numbers of undergraduates, and about, you know, eight, ten staff at any given point. At every moment, at every single moment of recruitment, of hiring, of retention, of admission, of et cetera, at every single moment, there needs to be someone, and ideally more than one someone, and ideally not just the one person of color on the, on the committee saying, are we paying attention to diversity here? <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's not an answer. That's a starting point. But without that starting point, it's just uh, a losing battle every time. So it's about finding the handful of coalition partners in whatever unit, in whatever committee, in whatever department, in whatever dorm it takes to say, let's start organizing around this and insisting on it, even if one or two of us aren't going to be at the meeting that day, um, so that it becomes uh, a routine question, a routine demand, and then becomes written into the structure of how hiring is done, gets written into the structure of how admissions is done, et cetera. And I'm not saying that that's an answer, but I'm saying without that, nothing will happen. That starts the conversation that improves diversity enough that the question gets asked by more people. And ultimately, I think in the case of our department, well, I think, you know, make, making significant progress over the last 10 years, I would say. But not satisfactory, just significant. Can, can I take this opportunity to put in a self-serving self plug? We're hiring a director for the Remington Center. <laughs> I'm the interim director. And one thing we've tried to do is put out the uh, PVL to lots of different lists of diverse people and then call upon, personally call upon people uh, in uh, all around the country that, that have, uh, you know, bring us some diversity of some sort. And uh, so if you know of anyone who is interested in a position directing, I think, a really wonderful center of legal clinics, um, please uh, let me know or go on our law school website and you can click on uh, open positions and there it is. So yeah. And I think both, my of shameless you, plug. both of you are really right that it takes that kind of uh, a very concerted effort. Um, so I want to give the panelists just a chance to, if there are things that you wanted to that you have one. Yeah. My name is Claudia Mosley. I'm with the Center for Educational Opportunity on campus. We are a um, partially TRIO funded uh, program that serves uh, students from first generation, who are first generation college students, students from low income households, and uh, students with disabilities. 
And I just want to, um, again, thank um, Ms. Sherry Bester for posing the question that she posed and for the student who talked about her feelings uh, in class. And I, I think some of our responses uh, gave her the responsibility of responding to the feelings that she has in class. And I just want to suggest that we all have a role. I have a role as a staff person at this institution. Everyone in the panel has a role. All of us in these seats have roles uh, to play. When we are on committees, when we are in meetings, when we are hiring, we have to uh, address these issues with our colleagues. We have to address these issues with our administrators uh, on a one a daily basis. Um, I, I totally agree that we do have to uh, have our students engage on campus. Um, I totally agree that we um, have to have some um, organization and, 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 and maybe some uprising to make some change, but we can make these little small changes every day to let students know that they belong here. They're getting messages all the time. Do we review our syllabi? In what ways are we um, setting up obstacles for our feelings of inclusion? How are we teaching? Is there something in our methodology or in the way that we um, have students apply for our majors, especially our competitive majors? We have to look at our policies and procedures as well, and we have to look at how we engage students in the way that we do business at this institution. So those are the larger scale, more long-term issues, but I think we really need to acknowledge that there are things that we can do every day, even in our conversations that we have today at lunch, and today as we transition to our next session um, to address this. So again, I just want to thank you for your courage in raising an issue that so many students um, have felt. Um, and staff, uh, I won't even get into that right now. So I just wanted to make that. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, wanted to follow that with a, um, w with a, I guess a plea to administrators and people who might be searching, uh, sitting on search committees to think more broadly about diversity. It's not just black, brown, red, yellow faces. It's diversity of thought. People of color, people who come from my community, for example, uh, have, have a different world view that elevates things like community service and applied theory and outreach uh, to publishing in uh, you know, high-level uh, research journals. Never in my experience working in, Indus, uh, in Indian country, when I've asked, you know, what, what do you need? What can the University of Wisconsin do from, for you? Never once has anyone said, you know, we, what we really need is a is a research is an academic article in a top tier research journal, <laughs> and this is what you know. This is what people who are really connected to their communities bring. You know, it's more important to us to do something beneficial for our communities, and research institutions aren't always amenable to that. Um, and so, uh, you know, th this is this really has implications when you're looking at diversifying your, you know, your faculty and your students and grad students and staff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank the panelists and thank the audience for such a great conversation. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. I really appreciate it.